As we begin a new year, we're taking a moment tonight to look back because pop culture didn't just mimic politics in 2017. This was the year pop culture was full of politics. And now there is no looking back. No hate, no fear. It began with the power of pink. Women by the millions marching in protest the day after President Trump's inauguration. Sexual misconduct would evolve from a secret to a movement. Feminism becoming the word of the year. In the age of President Trump, late night television became more political, more pointed, more angry. Are we going to have to eliminate another civil liberty every time the president is cranky and won't go down for his nap? Politics merged with sports. Patriotism mattered. And so did black lives. A bombing at an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, a mass shooting in Las Vegas, suddenly and sadly concerts weren't just about music, but also about fear. And in Canada, the cultural landscape became a little more barren with the death of one of our greatest artists. So we have this pop culture panel to talk about those and many more topics. Stephen Marsh who writes for Esquire magazine and the New York Times. Lincoln Anthony Blades is a digital columnist for Teen Vogue. And Yelena Adzik, entertainment reporter here at CBC. Welcome to all of you. Hi. Pleasure. This seems to be the year where politics and pop culture merged over and over again, overlapped. It got messy. It got tragic at times. And we could begin anywhere, but why don't we begin with late night television in the United States, Stephen, and, and hosts who seem to take on politics every night? Well, they have no choice. I mean, pop, this was the year that politics went into pop and pop went into politics. There's a, you know, there's a late night talk show host basically running the government at this point. There's a, there's a media personality uh, who does very little other than media running the government. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible fact that politics is now inseparable from our lives. Uh, it's one of the terrible things about this year. Uh, and they were just reflecting it. You're too young to remember this, both of you, I guess. But there used to be a guy named Johnny Carson whose humor was so gentle and uh, certainly not subversive. When you turn on late night TV, do you want politics with your comedy? I don't think that my human rights are political. I don't think that, like, you know, um, that's an issue of politics. So when you have a uh, candidate like Trump who runs on certain things that can be considered from, especially from people from marginalized communities, can be considered inhumane. When you have, like, Jimmy Fallon, and he's up there kind of massaging his head, it's like you don't realize that you're massaging the head of someone who's in directly endangering my life and directly endangering my kids. And that, to us, is like, okay, I can't watch you now. You know, and that's, that's what it became. It's not about politics, as it is about humanity. I think a huge shift has been, when you talk about Jimmy Fallon, right, he is there to sell what the celebrities are selling, right? It's a movie, it's a book, and they all started out that way. And eventually, now when we see, just, you know, pretty recently, you have someone like a Jimmy Kimmel holding his baby mm -hmm. at, during a monologue, bawling, and talking about how Congress needs to change the laws in relation to health and saying that, quote, it's disgusting mm -hmm. how they're putting the, the needs of the rich ahead of a little baby. That is powerful stuff. In America, politics has kind of always been entertainment. I mean, Norman Mailer said that, you know, the presidency is the lead actor in the soap opera of the country. That's what he said in the 70s. And of course, that's never been truer than now. Let's continue this theme about politics and pop culture and talk about sports. Again, for the longest while, people would say for athletes, play on the field, skate on the ice. We don't care what your politics are. Now you have Colin Kaepernick, who has taken a very, very public stand. Who wants to jump in? And, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, listen, Colin Kaepernick is set to become the first major star athlete to lose his career over his beliefs. So it is very fitting that, you know, within the month of December, he received the Muhammad Ali Legacy Award by Beyonce, no less. And you've seen star after star come to his aid. These are popular culture figures, influential, you know, Jay-Z, people like Shonda Rhimes, Uzo Aduba, Stevie Wonder, they all put out, whether it was social media posts or said something at their concerts, and that's just scratching the surface. There were many more. So contrast that with something like the Olympics of 1968, mm -hmm. where you saw the famous Black Power salute, and, and who supported them then, and how 
different the time was at that particular time, especially for John Carlos and Tommy Smith. And, you know, Tommy Smith was asked, they, people said, you're protesting at the wrong place. This isn't the venue. Obviously, people say that to Kaepernick, too. And he said, listen, I could have gone to Central Park. I could have done it over there, but no one would care. And that's the point. Here's the tough question, though, and I don't mean to throw cold water on that, and maybe this doesn't, but sure, uh, Kaepernick's gotten a lot of support across the United States, but isn't it just a kind of illustration of how divided the United States is? Has he changed any minds, do you think, in the United States? Uh, I don't think so. And um, because at the end of the day, we still call this anthem protests, and it's not an anthem protest. You no, know, I've been covering this story from the exact second it broke, and there has not been, I, there has not been one single anthem protest in this past 12, 13 months. So what is it? It's been a protest about against police brutality and inequality against marginalized groups, and they've used the anthem as a way to demonstrate what it is. But that's so lost people, on a lot of people. Yes. So, and the, and but there's people who I think it's willfully lost against. So this is the the discussion when you're talking about um, black athletes. Unfortunately, for black athletes, from the second that they start to integrate sports, our existence has been political. So our existence in sports has been political because our existence in society is political, and that's something that we're seeing with Colin Kaepernick, and also when you're talking about the divide, especially here in Canada, that's what you're seeing on the opposite end with the Pittsburgh Penguins, where they don't have the same diverse makeup, so they don't have the same diverse stances um, to these sorts of issues. That's why they could say, let's put politics aside, because we're going to just focus on going to see Donald Trump. We've gone this many minutes yeah. talking about politics and pop culture, and we haven't even mentioned Me Too. So, right. so Stephen, so much has been said about that. So much should be said about it. Yeah. What can we say about that tonight? Well, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes the changes that happen in these things are so invisible. They're not, like, you think, because they're spectacles, because we're watching sports spectacles, because we're watching film spectacles, that's how we process them. I think with Me Too, like, that is a real structural change to the nature of Hollywood. Like, if you're going to have a... a and the, the consequences of that will be play out over a decade or more. Like if you're not, like the, the point of Hollywood is that it is a group of very powerful men in control of a group of very beautiful women's bodies. That has been how it has worked for a hundred years. And when that changes, I don't I, like I don't know what will replace it. And I don't think anyone does. There's a critical mass of people who are now saying, with our eyeballs, we're not going to watch something. And it's not profitable anymore for them, or at least beneficial, to put a certain star. In almost all of the cases of the big wigs, the men who have fallen from grace, who've lost their jobs, they, in many cases, have been doing it for decades, or at least are accused mm -hmm. of doing it for decades. And so why now? Why now? Not because the silence breakers... Thank God for all the women and some men, too, years ago who broke the silence. No, right now they're profit breakers. And they are changing the game. But here's the problem. In a woman working in a factory or in a grocery store or somewhere where their boss is doing this to them, are they ever going to be shamed or outed in the way that can we as media cover all of the different uh, accusations out there? No, because I don't see significant change, at least not for a very long time, in a grand way. We've been talking up until now about how individuals have taken political or human rights issues and put them in areas that we don't normally hear or see them. Let's talk about where politics, if that's what we want to call it, has intruded on pop culture uh, in, in maybe the, the, the most grotesque way, and that is terrorism. Mm -hmm. Manchester, Victoria right. Day here in Canada. I remember driving back from, from a long weekend and hearing the, the, in, the news of all the people, all the Kids. young women who, uh, who had been killed in there. Is there anything other than sadness that we can take from what happened in Manchester? When the producer mentioned it to me, I'd yeah. actually forgotten about Manchester, and it just was like, how bad, how bad has 2017 been that the mass murder of children at an Ariana Grande concert, I don't have room in my brain for it anymore. I mean, what, what could be worse than blowing up a, a, a pop music concert? It's horrible what people can do. I mean, I do think it is amazing that terrorism has taken these targets from, from you know, military targets to then civilians are part of military, then they just go straight to art. They just go straight to the human dimension. But, you know, the truth is, like, they're just hitting, they're hitting where the symbolism is. And the symbolism is in these concerts. These are the, these are the best parts of living in free cities. We're talking about a year that has had 
a lot of low points in it and maybe a lot more sadness than, uh, than high points. But if I were to ask you to look back at 2017 from a pop culture perspective and, and tell me about something that you celebrate, you all look so sad after the conversation <laughs> well, we had. It's, it's a heavy year. <laughs> it's it's a heavy been year. a heavy year. <laughs> let's, let's, let's turn the corner for a bit as, as we get towards the end of this. And is there anything? Think of the, the, the opening scene of La La Land if you have to get happy for a moment. <laughs> yeah. There, so my big takeaway from 2017 was I loved the fact that not only did we see a great movie like Get Out come out, and actually uh, break barriers. Not only did we see our girls' night, we saw hidden figures, movies with black female leads get such big responses, but also the fact that we saw Moonlight win an award and we win Best Picture. And um, I thought La La Land won that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, despite the mix-up, it was it, it was amazing that this story about a young black gay boy growing up in Miami. Like, the fact that that could resonate with people, um, to me, it was amazing. Steven, celebrate 2017 in pop well, culture. Well, I mean, the reason I was looking sad when you said it is because the happiest... But like it was like, what was the best thing that happened in pop culture this year? It was the death of Gord Downey. It's like, oh, what a happy story! Some guy dying of brain, you know, brain cancer. But so on a the other sad hand, moment, it was but happy so because so affirmative of yeah. the power of art in the face of degradation and death, and in the fa and how important it is to make art, even the, in an honest way, even when you're facing, um, you know, devastation. And I just I saw them live the last concert in Toronto and. It was absolutely one of the most powerful um, concerts I'd ever I've ever seen, and uh, I think it was I think it was just um, kind of unique. You know, it was a unique way of confronting. You know, we're just so perfectly 2017. You know, like so confronting the darkness with like let's just light another candle. So from right. the first concert to the last concert, I mean, what a what an impact they've had in Canada for sure. And are you feeling good about anything about 2017? <laughs> no one invites me to parties. I wonder why. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm feeling good. You know, I, I think of when you're talking, I think of the, the poet Khalil, Khalil Gibran because when you think of the your greatest sorrow is also your greatest joy, man, that is Gord Downey. But what I think the key is, is that what Gord Downey would want us all to be talking about is not him at all. And that's what he did uh, to fight against the injustices for uh, Indigenous peoples. And I think that this year, with Canada 150, and really it's been pushed forward these deep conversations about how much pride should we have and maybe what should we not be so proud about. And I think that it's been so vital and so important to listen to those Indigenous voices, and it's been Gore Downey that's pushed that through. So I say 2017 is the year of deep, deep sorrow and really some, some incredible joy as well. Let's celebrate, uh, to or at least toast, to a much better 2018. Mm. I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> Very wistful. <laughs> right. Well, I wish I could, and I'll go. Yeah. You know what? Let's let's do yeah, it. Yeah, let's right. do it. Okay. Yeah. To Cheers. a better 2018. No one's inviting yeah. any of you to a party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you very much. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>